morning. Good morning. Glad to have you in church today. And I hope that your hearts are prepared. I hope you're ready. And look forward to what the Lord's going to do. Take your songbook, page 207. Here's a great song. And I love this song. And uh, only a sinner saved by grace, page 207. Think about it as you stand. And let's sing it out. Number 207. a good a reminder for us, a good reality check for us. We're only a sinner, and it wasn't for the grace of God. You know what grace is, don't you? Oh, yeah. It's God's riches at Christ's expense, and he loved us that much. He gave his only son. Aren't you thankful this morning? Hey. I sure am. I'm glad you're here today. We look forward to uh, this morning being in the Lord's house together. Let's pray, and we'll get started. Our Father, we love you. We're so thankful for this song that we can sing and for the grace that you've showed us, given us. And Lord, I pray that we'd never forget how good that you are. Yep. Lord, I pray this morning as we meet that you would meet with us. And Lord, we want to just come together this morning. We just want to brag on God this yep. morning how good that you are. We want to praise you and worship you. And Lord, I pray that you would do something special in our hearts and lives today. Fill this place with your Holy Spirit's presence. Lord, I pray that you would bless the young folks in junior church and toddler church. Lord, give them a, uh, an hour of learning, uh, Lord, and help them to uh, just to make a decision for you that they'll live for the Lord with their life. We sure do love you. We ask these things now in your precious name. Amen. Yep. You can be seated. Let's turn to page 227. No, I'm sorry. That is not the right song. I trust in my memory. I want to sing this song, I'm a Child of the King, 221, there it is, 221, I love this song, uh, praise the Lord, I'm a Child of the King, 221, let's sing it out on that first verse. Ready? My Father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands. Of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold, his coffers are full. He has riches untold. I'm a 
child of the King, a child of the King. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. My Father's own Son, the Savior of men, once wandered on earth as the poorest of them. But now he is pleading our pardon on high that we may be his when he comes by and by. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of Boy, this is a great verse on that third. Think about these words. Ready? I once was an outcast stranger on earth A sinner by choice And a Oh, I like this part But I've been adopted My name's written down child of the king you know somebody made a statement they said that the music prepares the heart for the preaching and while that's not a bad statement i i kind of agree with that as well but i like this our music is also worship to the lord it's not just the preaching time but man when you think about the message and song that we sing it ought to do something for you I love this last verse, a tent or a cottage, why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Sing it out, ready? A tent or a cottage, why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Though exiled from home, yet still I may sing. child of the king. I'm a child of the king, a child of the king. With Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the king. How many of you are a child of the king this morning? Say amen, would you? I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad that I know, that I know, that I know yes, I'm going to heaven. You know, there's sometimes when we have to think about things and we have to wonder, did I do this or did I forget about this? I don't ever have to wonder that I'm going to heaven. If your name's been written in the book of life, it's there and I'm so thankful for our salvation. Well, let's go through a couple announcements this morning. You're welcome to follow along in your bulletin. And... Uh, we enjoyed uh, such a great week last week, Harvest Sunday, and now we're in the month of November and, and just as excited about this month of church, and I look forward to these days coming up. But this morning, I'd like for you to remember our missionary of the week, and uh, this week we're highlighting the Norton family. Uh, Brother Miss Norton, we uh, thank the Lord for them. They've been on the field for quite a while. And uh, they are uh, serving. Matter of fact, they're actually transitioning to a, a new location, and they're going to be serving in Italy now. Uh, they were over in Slovenia, and they were in Italy before, and, and the Lord has kind of moved them locations again, and we're thankful for that. But if you would pray for them, they've got a busy season uh, in their life with the transition, but they're reaching souls. So thankful for them. If you would remember them in prayer. And then these prayer requests as well. Um, we would ask you to continue to pray for Brother Matt Kelly, and I believe we're going to pray him right home. He is doing so much better now. He's able to start therapy, I believe. They've been working with him, getting him up and walking and, or, or standing. And uh, But just pray for him and his family there 
um, that's a blessing. Pray for Brother Ted Townland. Brother Ted will go in this week for uh, hip surgery, uh, hip, uh, get that hip fixed that's been bothering him for so long. And I think it's on the 9th, if I remember correctly. And so, um, matter of fact, let me look at my prayer list, and I think that it, I have it written down there. Uh, I believe it's the 9th, but let's pray for him. And then also pray for Haley McCutcheon. Uh, we've been praying for her, but the family asked prayer yesterday. She was in a car accident, and it and now it looks like um, she's going to have to have surgery on her neck to repair some damage uh, there. So if you would pray for Haley and her family. And then uh, let's continue to pray for so many folks that are recovering and rehab. Our list is so long, uh, but pray for everyone that, that we've mentioned on Wednesday night prayer. It's good to see uh, Brother Nolan this morning. We've been praying for his wife and um, said that she's uh, she's making progress and little by little and so we praise the lord for that and so but let's pray for these folks this morning and of course our country now i want to give a plug for tonight's church service uh, because i'm talking about praying for one another and i have on our uh, prayer uh, our bulletin here just a reminder about our country but but can i challenge us this morning if there's any hope uh, for our country if there's any hope for our homes, for our churches, that it's going to come through prayer. I Amen. believe that with all my heart. And, uh, you know, we often will say that we're a people of prayer or, or we're a, a Bible-believing, a praying church. But are we really? Are we really? Or do we just have a kind of a token prayer life? And, and, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful we teach our kids to pray and thank the Lord for the, the blessings and the meal time. I'm thankful we teach them that at nighttime we'll pray as they go to bed. But prayer is more than that. Yeah. It's more than those token prayers. It ought to be about our life, having a prayer life. And I believe it's so important that uh, we get this nailed down. And I want to challenge you on Sunday nights, beginning tonight, uh, to be here as we study uh, this topic of prayer. For the next 10 weeks, there's ten going to be 10 lessons. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. But I believe with all my heart it's what the Lord wants. And we're gonna, going to hear from Dr. Tom Williams uh, by way of, of DVD, uh, 10 different messages on a prayer. And I believe it will change your life. I really believe that with all my heart. Uh, but I want you to be here. Don't just uh, be hit and miss. Come tonight. Be faithful all through it. We'll have a handout, a booklet for each family as you can follow along. And, and it will help you. Uh, to keep up with, with the lessons and the preaching. And um, I tell you what, if we will commit ourselves to the Lord through our prayer life, through our walk with Him, through serving Him, uh, you're going to find that He'll be faithful to you. And so many times in life, uh, we, we lack so many things. Uh, you know, uh, we, we lack the Lord's uh, blessings in our life. We, we lack His power, His help. And it's not his fault, but it's, it's my fault. The Lord is faithful to us as we're faithful to him. So tonight's going to be so important. Uh, we'll, we'll shorten our format just a little bit on Sunday nights because I don't want to get too lengthy uh, with our time. Uh, but it'll be an enjoyable time, and I pray that it'll be a helpful time on Sunday night. So that's tonight. We're also going to have our missions moment tonight. We uh, didn't have one last month because we had Mission Sunday in October, but we'll be back on track with our missions moment on the first Sundays of the month. And tonight we're going to hear from the Marco family, and they are just about to fly back to the Philippines here in just another week or so, and they're so excited. Now, you won't want to miss tonight seeing the Marcos on the on the live video, and they'll give us an update. They're going to sing a song for us, a special song, and it'll be a good time with that. Uh, these upcoming announcements, uh, we have Veterans Sunday next week. Don't miss it. It'll be a special Patriotic Sunday. We've got some uh, flags that uh, we're going to be putting up to display as far as the branches of the military and the American flag, both inside and outside. We'll have a small token, uh, a gift for each veteran that's here that day. So as I've been saying often, invite somebody to come, uh, whether it's a neighbor, family member, somebody that you meet. That, that you know they were in the service, be here next Sunday uh, for the 1030 service, and we'll look forward to a great day next week. Uh, I went ahead and, and added uh, several announcements as we get closer to the holidays, just to give folks a heads up so you can make sure you have these on your calendar. And I'll go over them real quick. 
We'll have a Sunday night delight on November 21st. This is the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and we'll have a time of fellowship after church on Sunday night. Uh, most typically, it'll just be a dessert fellowship as we uh, just want to take time as a church to have a, uh, just a small get-together and thank the Lord, have kind of a blessing, a Thanksgiving night at church on Sunday night, November 21st. Then our midweek service will be moved to Tuesday, the 23rd uh, of Thanksgiving. We have a blood drive uh, that I've uh, host or scheduled for our church to host. Of course, it's for the community, but I want to mention that um, and there's a great need for blood. I think it's a good thing to give blood. And so just note that on your calendar, Monday the 29th, if you'd like to be a part, I know there'd be a blessing. Our Christmas banquet on December 5th, Sunday night at 5 o'clock, will begin with a good meal right before the 6 o'clock service. We'll have a great time at the Christmas banquet. Uh, we have several sign-up sheets, or at least a couple in the back. And I'll mention these real quick. Uh, we're going to take the sign-up sheet down for the Christmas play in Iowa. Uh, we, we have to give our final number uh, here shortly. So if you're thinking about it and you want to go, go ahead and sign up. We'll be leaving on Saturday, December 11th. Did I get it right? Saturday, December 11th. It'll be all day long. It's a great, great Christmas play. Uh, no charge for it, uh, but just um, money to eat as we eat out on the road, and, and so that'd be great. So sign up on, on that sheet. And then there is a sign-up sheet for the Christian Womanhood magazine. That's a monthly magazine that uh, several of the ladies subscribe to. I would encourage every lady to subscribe to that magazine. It is full of good stuff in there and uh, has very... Um, very good materials for the ladies. I even get a glimpse at it once in a while. I said, boy, that was good. I might have to preach on that next time. Um, but sign up on the sheet. If you don't know what it is, um, there are several ladies that have those. I'm sure they'd be glad to share with you what it looks like. Uh, but if you sign up, the cost is uh, $20 for the year, and you'll get a magazine every month. So it's just a dollar and some change per magazine, and, um, and, and that'll come every month. But we need to do that uh, here shortly, get that subscription turned in. And then the first one will be in January of next year that you'll receive. And then there is the Christmas card box on the back table. And I'd really like to, uh, to encourage you to use that, send a Christmas card, a note to, our, to, to members in the church. And we'll pass out the Christmas cards at the Christmas banquet on December 5th. And I always get behind on that, but this year I said I'm not getting behind. So the box is back there today. How many have already thought about Christmas? How many has already bought gifts? A few of you. And uh, you know that is not me. I am the December 20th guy trying to go to Dollar Tree and get all my gifts. Uh, no, I'm not that stingy. Uh, we'll go to Dollar General and get our gifts. Uh, no, you know what ours is. We do a lot of online shopping. Uh, maybe that's not good for our local economy, but uh, just such a busy life. Anyway, a Christmas card box back there. Take advantage of that. Be a blessing to one another, and we look forward to that. Good to have uh, uh, you folks in church today. Good to have my brother Stephen and his wife, yes. uh, Heather, with us. They live up, uh, up where I'm from, around Hannibal. They live in Quincy, but they've been down visiting this week. Good to have them. They've got five children. They're scattered around uh, throughout the uh, Sunday schools and nurseries, so good to have them. Let's take our songbook. We're going to have another good song, and then we'll take our offering this morning. So, Brother Carol, why don't you come lead us? Take your hymn, we'll turn to number 127. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Boy, nothing sweeter than that.
Hey. All right, it's time for the offering. I thought Brother Doc was coming down to hit the altar already, and then I realized, no, it's just offering time. But All right, let's be faithful in our giving this month, first Sunday of the month. So we've got a new month, and I trust you'll be faithful in your tithe and your missions giving. And the Lord's been good to us. Yeah. Amen. And let's be faithful to him. Let's pray now. Uh, Brother Doc, would you ask the blessing upon the offering? Take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Job. The book of Job. Or maybe you've not been saved very long and you pronounce it the book of Job. That'll be okay. But it's about Job, a man named Job. And I'm excited about the message this morning. If you will, turn to Job chapter 1 and verse number 6. And if you would stand as we read the scripture this morning. Job chapter 1 and verse number 6 is where we'll begin, and we'll read down through verse number 12. Job chapter 1, beginning in verse number 6. Here's what the Bible says. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And I want you to again realize as we read, this is not a fairy tale. Uh, this is a reality of life. The devil is walking around, and he is going to and fro in the earth. In verse number 8, the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man? One that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou, hast not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? That thou, uh, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land? But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath. And he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. What an interesting passage of scripture that we find here. The life of Job. I'm thankful for him. And as the Bible says, he was a good man. He was a godly man. But I want to look at verse number 10. And I want to read verse 10 again. I want you to notice this interesting statement or question that Satan asked. He said in verse number 10, Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Satan realized that there was a hedge about Job. 
And I want to preach a message this morning with this thought. Thank God for the hedge. Thank God for the hedge. Let's pray. I'll have you be seated. We'll enjoy a special song, then we'll get to the preaching. Our Father, we love you this morning. Thank you so much for your word. Lord, I am 41 years old. I've been saved most all of my life. Definitely been in church, read the Bible so many times. I don't even remember how many times I've read through the Bible. Lord, I've heard so many messages and preaching, but I'm so thankful that, Father, when we open your word, it's fresh and new every single time. And, Lord, this morning as I stand here to preach, Lord, in my heart, I believe I'm just as excited today as the first time I opened your word to preach. But what a book. What a God that we serve. Lord, would you help us this morning to open up our heart for what you have for us. Lord, I pray through the preaching would be helped. Lord, help me, I pray. Just take control. And Lord, I pray that after all is said and done in a while, Lord, we can say it's been good to be in your house. Father, bless this song now. May it be a help and an a encouragement to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
tell you what, that's a great song. If that, uh, they say, if that don't light your fire, your wood's wet. And that'll prime the pump right there. I'm excited about the Lord. He's so good to us. I love that line there. The one that feeds a sparrow. And he, he knows about the birds. You don't think he cares about me? Absolutely he does. Man, that, uh, that's a great song. I appreciate that. Back to Job chapter number one this morning. If you will, again, draw your attention to verse number 10. Hast thou not made an hedge about him? And this was Satan asking a question to the Lord. He said, now, uh, now, now, God, he said, I understand you're talking about Job, and he's such a great man. But he said, I've got a question for you. Uh, don't you have a hedge about him? Not only him, but about his house and about everything that he has, all of his possessions. He says, you have blessed his hands, right? And his substance is increased in the land. And of course, uh, the Lord would, uh, would have to answer in the affirmative and say, yes, that is correct. And of course, we'll look a little bit later on how he took that protection away from him. But this morning, I want us to notice this word here, or this phrase in verse number 6, or verse number 10, Hast thou not made an hedge about him? That word hedge there is the only time this word is mentioned in the entire book of Job. The only time you'll find the word hedge mentioned. But hedge, this word, the meaning of hedge, plays such an important part in this story. And I thank God this morning for the hedge that he has placed around you and me. I thank God for the hedge he placed around Job. And this morning, I tell you, I just want to brag a little bit about God. I just want to thank God this morning a little bit for the protection, for the hedge that he has placed about you and I, that he's placed about our church. I want you to notice in verse number 7 some things about Satan. And if you're taking notes, I'll give you point number 1 that might help you with the thought process that I'm using this morning. But number 1, I want you to see Satan's obsession. Satan's obsession. The Bible says in verse number 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? So he asked Satan, he said, Hey, where did you come from? What have you been up to? What have you been doing? And here's Satan's answer. He said to the Lord, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Do you understand Satan's obsession this morning is to travel this world, travel this earth, to and fro, up and down, going about doing as much damage as he can to this whole earth, to God's people. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse number 8, to be sober, to be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, here it is now, seeking whom he may devour. That's the devil's obsession. That is what drives him every day that he is, uh, has an opportunity to do this. Can I ask you this morning, have you ever had something in your life that drives you? I tell you what drives me as a man, as a husband, as a father, I love my family. You know, that's what motivates me to get up every day and go to work. Uh, that's what motivates me every day to go out and provide for them. Uh, I tell you, I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my wife and what a blessing that my wife is to me. I'm thankful for my children and what a blessing my daughter is to me. Amen. Uh, no, my boys are a blessing too. But listen, I love my family. Family's important to me. That's what drives me. People have different things that drive them in life. Can I tell you what drives the devil? What he is obsessed with is destroying everything and everybody that he comes in contact with. The devil's busy searching for people to destroy. We all know of folks in our life that, uh, and, and even ourself, where the devil has got to us and people that we know, and he has had his way with them. The Bible talks about the devil and sin. It'll take you farther than you want to go. It'll cost you more than you want to pay and keep you longer then you want to stay. That's what drives the devil. Why uh, is he so busy? I believe the devil knows his time is short, Brother Carol. I believe that old uh, clock is running out. Our children love to play hide and seek right now. 
And uh, they have taught Delaney because she uh, hasn't figured out quite how to count to, you know, 30 or whatever. And so she'll take the phone or, or something and set the timer on it for 30 seconds. And it'll begin to count down. And when that timer goes off, then she knows it's time for me to go find whoever's hiding. You see, I believe the devil knows that the timer is running out. I believe that he hears it getting shorter and those beeps are getting faster and faster. I believe he knows his time is short and, and mark it down. He is working overtime today. Can you not see it? It's all around us. Oh, yeah. The wickedness that's out there. He is walking up and down throughout the earth. He's walking through our cities. He's walking through our towns and our neighborhoods. And he's got one thing on his mind and one thing only. And that is complete and utter destruction. What does John chapter 10 say in verse number 10? It talks about the thief. Yeah. It says, and of course the devil is a thief. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's his purpose. Do you understand that today? He wants to come and destroy everything that he can. And there's not a moment of the day. I think we need to understand this as we're setting up the foundation for this message this morning. Understand that there's not a moment of the day that the devil is not trying his best to destroy you. What? He's got your number. I mean, listen, you've got a big target on your back and he knows it and he's aiming for it. We'll sometimes, uh, you know, play a game and his family, uh, you know, the fun thing to do is to gang up on dad, right? And if we're playing a game at the table or whatever it might be, as long as dad loses, that's all that matters. When my in-laws come over, uh, we'll, we'll sit down and we'll play a game. You know, it's not about who wins. It's just about if I get beat, brother Kevin. That's just the way it is. Now, I'm a little bit competitive, and so maybe that's part of it. Uh, it. Probably it's because what we do when my dad comes around. My dad is super competitive, and I don't care if, if anybody else wins as long as dad loses. And uh, he still uh, can hold his own at most things that he does. And we go up and we play pool. My dad's a great pool player, and it's hard to beat my dad in a game of pool. And I play pretty, pretty decent, I think. Uh, now we can finally beat him at basketball. He's slowed down enough. We can beat him at basketball. But man, I tell you what, uh, it, it's just all about if he loses, that's the, that is Satan's attitude for us. It's all about him winning the victory over us. And he'll do everything that he can to destroy you and I. Matter of fact, sometimes he'll use other people to do that. He'll use family members to try to get to you, to discourage, to perhaps destroy you, your friends or neighbors. Uh, he'll use a job. He'll put a, 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 a thing that looks good out there to try to destroy you from what you should be for the Lord. He'll take your finances. Uh, he'll use everything that he can to try to be a wedge between you and God. Matter of fact, we know today uh, that he uses the Internet, the television to try to destroy yeah. people. Computers, cell phones, laptops, TV. Uh, you understand the Bible says that Satan is the prince and the power of the what? Of the air. Now, I'm not trying to connect this passage of Scripture and saying this is what it applies to today. Uh, but think about the airwaves today. Think about the television. Think about uh, the Internet. And it's not just everything that's connected by wires anymore. Everything is wireless. It goes through the air. And you think that the devil is not the prince and power of the air? Yeah. And I believe that the internet, uh, the, the television, the things that, that now are through the airwaves, if you will, is going to be the death of our country. He's going to use that to destroy people's lives. All it can be used for good, and we all use it. We're all connected. It's a way of living. Matter of fact, uh, some people have held out and say, I refuse to get connected to the technology and things. Uh, but honestly, there's going to be a point where you can't do anything unless you're connected. And the devil knows that. And he'll use what can be good for bad and for evil to destroy people. He'll use lost people to destroy uh, other folks. He'll use church people to destroy other folks. Matter of fact, the devil doesn't care about you or your happiness at all. He has one thing in mind, and that's to destroy you can i tell you if you're lost this morning he'll do everything he can to get you to die in your sin to try to cause you to think that you're good enough 
that you are okay, that you're not that bad. He'll cause you to think that if I do more good than bad in my life, and if I give to charity, and if I do good things, I'll make it to heaven. He'll cause you to die and spend an eternity in hell. Yeah. But can I tell you, if you're saved this morning, hey, listen, the battle is not over. He'll do everything he can to rob you of your joy. He'll do everything he can to rob you of your testimony and your fellowship with Christ. Why? Because if he can get you destroyed in your heart, in your life, he can cause you to not be effective for the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, the devil works 24-7, nonstop. He, he doesn't ever clock, clock out. He's always on the clock. Every day, every hour, he'll do everything he can to wear you down, to break you down, to pull you down. We'll watch sometimes on the National Geographic channel. And maybe, maybe it's not appealing to some, but it's kind of fascinating to us. And we'll watch out in the, the safaris. We'll watch the animal life and how they survive. And we'll watch those lions and how they attack their prey. You understand the Bible says that the devil is as a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. And when that lion uh, zones in on that prey, can I tell you, he doesn't give up. She doesn't give up. Uh, they finally uh, get the advantage over that prey. They go for the juggler. They clamp on and they do not let go. And that's the devil, my friend, this morning. Everything that he can do, he'll do to break you down, to wear you out, and to cause you to not be effective for Christ. You see, that's his obsession. Verse number seven, he's walking to and fro, going up and down in the earth, looking for that person. Then I want to notice number two, verse number eight, the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? I want you to notice the Savior's observation. The Savior's observation. We said number one, notice Satan's obsession. Number two, we see the Savior's observation. He said to Satan, he said, now let me ask you a question. Have you considered Job? He said, I want to make some observations about my servant. And there's a record here that's, that's uh, pretty clear. There, there, there's not really any arguing here that Job was being watched. He was under observation. Yeah. Satan was looking at him. God was looking at him. He was under a microscope, if you will. But I want you to notice how the Lord looked upon Job as he observed him. Verse number 8, he says, uh, there's nobody like him. I mean, this was a, a good thing. Uh, this was a delightful observation, if you will. And think about if you were Job, uh, maybe you wouldn't want to be considered. Uh, but in a way, uh, wouldn't that be just a great testimony of you and I? If God could say, you know what, there's, there's somebody down there that loves me. Uh, there's somebody that is upright in all his ways. He fears me. He hates evil. There's somebody like that, and his name is Job. You know, I'm glad to know, first of all, that I have a God that considers me. Amen. Friend, this morning, I want you to understand that there's a real devil out there, and he's obsessed with destroying people. But there is a God that's obsessed with watching over you. There is a God that's obsessed with caring for you and considering you. It's very clear from verse number 8 that we can understand God had been watching Job. God had been observing him. God had his eye on him. God was, uh, if you will, giving a testimony about Job to Satan. He was bragging about his servant Job. And he said, I want you to notice something. He said, first of all, he's a servant of mine. He said, have you noticed Job? He said, Thou hast, hast thou considered my servant, Job? What a great observation. Can I ask you this morning, if you were going to have a testimony about your life, would God speak of you as a servant? Would he say, have you considered my servant? Put your name in there. I mean, this speaks that Job loved God. This speaks of Job's service to the Lord. I preached a message just a few weeks ago on this thought of, do you have a towel and we, 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 we saw in Scripture how the towel represented someone that was ready to serve. Are you serving God? 
You know, I believe that we're put here on this earth for a reason. It's to bring honor and glory to Him. It's to walk with God. It's to serve Him. I preached just last Sunday morning about the harvest. The harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. Job was a servant of God. The Bible said of Job that there was none like him. It says in verse number 8, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth. What does this mean? He was one of a kind. There was nobody like him. Have you ever met somebody like that before? You say, man, that person was pretty amazing. I've never met anybody like that. That was Job. Uh, he was perhaps superior than any other servant of God. Uh, he was one that loved God more than perhaps anybody else during that time. Now I want you to understand in the history of this book, the history of the Bible, that this book, Job here, is one of the very oldest books in the Bible. Amen. Job was in the, man, way back in the beginning of time. Obviously, uh, Adam and Eve were already created. They were the first people created. But not long after the Garden of Eden, uh, we find Job. He was superior. He was a perfect man, the Bible says, and upright. Perfect meaning that, uh, no, he wasn't sinless, but he was a sound Christian. Uh, somebody explained it like this. A perfect man speaks of the soundness of Job. It means this, he was a mature Christian. Uh, he was complete, if you will. Again, not referring to being sinless in, in that definition of perfect uh, or, you know, without fault, uh, but being perfect as far as being complete, being whole. Job was a person who was very sound in his Christian life. He was upright. What is this speaking of? Well, I believe it's speaking of his spirituality. He knew where God was in his life, and that was the first place. He had an attitude about him that says, the only thing that matters in my life is what I do to please the Lord. I believe he was trying to be like Christ. Now think about this, and I, I, I love this thought. And we go back to Adam and Eve in the garden. Do you understand that they did not have the word of God to lead them and to guide them like we have today? Uh, we have the 66 books of the Bible we have the complete Word of God. It's called the canon of Scriptures. And everything I believe with all my heart, everything God wanted us to have today, we have in the Bible. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. We have the perfect Word of God in our hands today. Now, think about this. Adam and Eve didn't have that. They didn't have a Bible they could go and open up and read. So what did they have to do? They had to walk with God. That's why God created Adam. To walk with him in the cool of the day. Walk with him there in the Garden of Eden. And I believe God would fellowship with them. And God would instruct them. And God would help them along in their life as they walked with him. Job was the same way. He didn't have the word of God to lead him and guide him. But God would walk with him. God would speak to his people. And we find throughout scripture in the Old Testament that God spoke to his people. That's how God worked. We had the spoken word of God. Today we have the written word of God. But Job had to realize, I must walk with him. If I want to be an upright man, if I want to be like Christ, I have to walk with him. The Bible says to be holy, for I am holy. How are we going to do that? We're going to have to be around God, find out what he wants us to do. We're going to have to walk with him, spend time with him. And then the Bible says that he... Feared God and eschewed evil. It speaks of Job's sanctification. He, he hated evil. Uh, he, he didn't like it. He didn't. Now listen, we could stop here and preach a whole message this morning on eschewed or eschewing evil. Amen. Do I hate sin? Now if I had a raise of hands this morning, I believe probably everybody in here would say, Yes, preacher, I hate the devil and I hate sin. But then let, let's stop and think for a moment. Then, then why do I play with sin all the time? Why do I allow it all the time to enter my mind, to enter the eye gate or the ear gate, and then it dwells in my mind, it can then get down into my heart. Uh, why do I do that? Job was not that way. I believe uh, this with all my heart, that Job hated sin. When he saw it, he turned from it. He didn't allow it to entertain his mind at all. He was trying his best to live a life pleasing to the Lord. He was 
sanctified. You know, you and I are sanctified as well. That means we're set apart. If you're a child of God this morning, uh, listen, you are saved. You are set apart to do a work for Christ. And if I fool around and play with the world, play with sin, I cannot be used as God would want me to be used. So we see it was a good thing as the Lord made some observations about Job. It was delightful. But I want you to notice something else about this observation and uh, this is what Satan said in verse number 10, uh, or verse number 9. He's, then Satan answered the Lord and said, Now notice this question, Doth Job fear God for naught? Now as you read that, you probably at first glance think, I, I really don't understand what that question is. Doth Job fear God for naught? This is a very interesting question. First of all, the question is, th or, or the observation is this that satan knew job by name he called him he had his number again that targets on his back doth job fear you for naught or does job fear god for nothing or what's the reason why does job fear god i know there's got to be a reason it's not for nothing something in his life caused him to fear god Satan's logic perhaps caused him to believe that Job feared God because of what God had done for him. God had blessed him, no doubt. And um, Satan's logic maybe what was that Job fears God because God has blessed him. He has provided for him. He has blessed his life. And that's an interesting statement. And I want to say this this morning. People that do not fear God are not people that don't have a reason to fear Him. Think about that. People that don't fear God, Christians alike, the world alike, people that don't fear God are not people that don't have a reason to fear Him. We all have a reason to fear Him. Uh, it's simply this. Folks either don't know what God has done for them or they do not care. If you realize what God has done for you, if you realize who God is and how He loves you, how He cares for you, that ought to cause you to fear Him. Can I remind you what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs? The beginning, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do you know the way to become a wise person? A way to step up your intelligence in life, if you will? It begins with fearing the Lord. Well, what does that mean? I know who He is. I know what He's done for me. And because of that, I want to fear Him. I want to love Him. I want to put Him first. I don't want the wrath of God to fall upon me. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, Or despisest thou the riches of His goodness and forbearance and long suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. It's the goodness of God that should lead me to repentance. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 19, We love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The devil knew that Job feared God because... Of all that God had done for him. The devil wouldn't understand that though. Why? He's never done anything good for anybody. The devil has never blessed anyone. The devil has never loved anyone or been good to anybody. He's out to kill. He's out to steal and to destroy. And it's an interesting observation that the Savior made. And he talked about his servant Job. It's interesting the observation that Satan made. Why does Job fear God? And that brings me to this, number three. Verse number 10, we find this phrase, Hast not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. We see number three, the Savior's protection. The Savior's protection. 
You understand this hedge here was not made by man. It wasn't an exterior wall out there. It wasn't a fortress that Job lived inside so nobody could get to him. It wasn't anything like that, but it was a spiritual hedge that God had placed about him. It was not made by man. The hedge, think about this, it was not made by his parents. His parents could not protect him. The hedge wasn't made by his family. It wasn't made by his spouse. The hedge wasn't made by the pasture. It wasn't made by the church. But the hedge was made by God. And this goes back to the importance, as I mentioned earlier in my announcements, of prayer. We ought to pray for one another. Pray that God would protect one another. As a parent, I ought to pray for my children. Do you understand that I cannot, I cannot build a hedge about my children. It can't be done. If I could, I'd do it. I'd keep them inside that boundary and I'd say, man, I don't want them to be influenced by the world. And, the wicked. and we can do that a little bit while they're younger. There comes a time we can't build a hedge anymore. The only hedge that can be built for our children is by God. We ought to pray for one another. God made the hedge about Job. And it wasn't just about him, but the Bible says it was about all his house. It was about everything that he had. Uh, the Bible says about all that he hath on every side. What an amazing verse. Think about as God looks down upon his children. And God wants to build a hedge about you. He wants to build a hedge about your house, about your family, about everything he had. And Satan knew that. He knew that it wasn't just Job that was protected, but it was his family. It wasn't just about Job that was protected, but it was about everything he had. And that's what the reason we find as we get later in the story, and we'll not focus on this part of Job. But when God removed that hedge, what did Satan attack first? It wasn't Job first, but it was about everything that he had. And I'm thankful that the Lord protects us. I'm thankful that the Lord protects what we have. Satan admit, admitted something that, was, that proves that the hedge was successful. Notice, he says, Put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put forth thine hand, put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Do you understand what took place in that verse? God said, Okay, I'll remove that hedge of protection from everything that he has. Satan even realized he couldn't get through that hedge. Satan admitted something so important, and that was this. I can't do anything to Job as long as the hedge is there. With all of the experience that Satan had, and he's slick. You can call him Slick Willie if you want. He knows all the tricks of the trade. He knows how to get folks, but he can't do that unless the protection is removed. The Bible is very clear in 1 John chapter 4, and verse number 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I'm thankful this morning for the hedge that God has placed about you and I, about our family. Now here's the story here. That God lifted the hedge to accomplish a few things. Let's look down to verse number 12. The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. So he lifted the hedge. And he told him, he said, You just can't touch Job himself. The reason that Job was tested, the reason the hedge was lifted, and, and then we end up finding in verse number 6 of chapter 2 later on, that now the hedge was lifted about his own personal health in his life. Yeah. He said to Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So now he turned Job into Satan's hand, but he said, you can't kill him. You can touch him, but you can't kill him. The reason why, I believe, first of all, was to prove Job's faithfulness to God. To prove Job's faithfulness. Now, I'm thankful that the hedge that we have about us is there. If you're a child of God, we sang the song this morning, I'm a child of the King. 
there's a hedge about you. God protects you. God loves His own. Now, I'll say a couple different things about the hedge. Now, you can go outside that hedge of protection if you want to. You can jump the fence if you want to. But can I tell you, when you do that, you're playing around with danger. We had horses growing up. We had uh, the main fence, the main uh, part of the uh, corral, if you will, that, that was fenced in, barbed wire fence with electric on the inside of it. But then we had some other fields that we wanted them to graze in, and, and, uh, but we didn't put the barbed wire around the field. We just put electric fence around it. And sometimes a deer would come and run through the electric fence and pop the connectors off the post so the, the wire would be laying on the ground or real low. And those horses would jump that fence. You know what happens outside that fence? Danger out there. Uh, there's a highway down the, the gravel lane from where we live that they could get out on and, and get hit. As a matter of fact, I've hit a horse before in my little S10 pickup truck. And the horse won, let's just say that. The truck didn't win. Those are big animals. Listen, it's dangerous out there. But as long as you live inside the protection, you're going to be okay. And so you can leave that hedge on your own. Or sometimes God may allow Satan to come inside. He'll lift that hedge. Why? To prove his faithfulness. Now here's what Satan told, told God. He said this, Lord... Look, verse chapter 2, verse number 5. He said, uh, well, let's just read it. Satan answered the Lord in verse number 4. Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Yeah. Satan said, hey, Lord, if I can get to Job, he said, I promise you this, he will curse you to your face. And God told Satan, he said, no, he won't. He loves me. And it was to prove his faithfulness to God. But there was only one, one way to find out. To lift that hedge and allow Job to be tested to prove that faithfulness. Part of the story and the, uh, the destruction of Satan here was that Satan destroyed everything that he had. He took his family away from him. He took his friends away from him. But Job stayed faithful to the Lord. We'll not take time to look through that whole story. But Job was faithful. Number two, why did God lift the hedge? Was to purify his faith. To purify his faith. If you will, keep your finger there, but turn to Job chapter 23. Job chapter 23. In verse number 10. Here's what Job said. In Job 23, verse number 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job said, I'm going to stay true to God even though I'm being tested. Because I realize God knows what's going on. God knows the pressure I'm under. God knows the fire I'm going through. When I come through this fire, I'll be purified as gold. Though Job was perfect and upright, though he was one that feared God and hated evil, he still knew that there was room for improvement. I can always improve in my life. He knew that he would survive. He knew he'd make it. And then another reason why God lifted the hedge was to promote Job. What does this mean? To raise him up again and to bless him even more than he ever thought he could be blessed. In Job chapter 42, verse 12, the Bible says, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. We'll not go through the numbers to tell you all the blessings that Job had, but he had way more than he ever thought he would have. Why? Because he stayed faithful to God. The Bible says that his substance was increased. You see, God wanted to do more for Job. He wanted to bless Job more than he had ever been blessed. So God lifted the hedge this morning i'm thankful for the hedge put about you and i yep. can i just be honest with you this morning we don't know what god is protecting us from we have no idea we have no idea we could all probably tell stories of things in our life that have happened that were close calls 
I mean, perhaps it was a physical close call and we almost got hurt really bad or we almost died. There are other things in life that we can say, I'm thankful, uh, man, you know, my house could have burned down and I caught this just in time. Or my health could have been affected or, or my children. All these things. And there's a hedge about us. We don't even know. But can we understand this? As much as I'm thankful for the hedge, if God decides to lift the hedge, there's a reason for it. To see if I'll be faithful to Him. To see if I can be purified a little bit more in my faith. But perhaps it's because God wants to bless me more and He can only do it through this way. But I'm thankful that the hedge was only lifted temporarily. It was just a short time. All to Job, it seemed like an eternity. But in reality, it was just a short time. Isn't it amazing as we look back on our life? While we're in the middle of a trial, we think it's forever. I mean, is this ever going to end? But I look back and I say, you know, time went by pretty quick. This morning, can I challenge you to thank the Lord for the hedge that is about you. It's about your family. It's about our church. Because honest truth is this, there is a devil out there. He's looking to seek, to kill, to destroy. Can I encourage you as we live in this world today, it, it's a wicked place. I mean, I don't like to think about where our country is headed unless revival happens, unless something takes place. But can I promise you this? If you love God, you put Him first, He's got a hedge about you, you're going to be okay. He's going to take care of his own. We have nothing to worry about. Let's do right. Let's serve him. And let's see how he'll take care of us. And like Job says, even if the hedge is lifted, when I am tried, I'll come forth as gold. Thank God for the hedge this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this scripture. Thank you for Job and his life. And an interesting phrase that, Lord, I've not really looked at this way before. As Satan asked about that hedge. Lord, I thank you for the hedge that you put about us this morning. And Lord, how you love us, how you take care of us. Lord, there's times we don't deserve it. We understand that. We're not worthy. But Father, as you take care of the birds of the field, the fowls of the air, Lord, you take care of us. You protect us. Lord, I pray this morning that we'd be drawn closer to you because of the preaching of your word. Lord, if we have gotten outside that hedge today of our own will, of our own doing, Lord, would we realize it's better to get back in the perfect will of God. It's the safest place to be. Help us to run back where we should be. Father, as we begin our invitation time, our prayer time, we turn this part over to you. Lord, work now in the hearts of those that are here today. And whatever your will is, we pray that it would be accomplished. In Christ's name, amen. If you would stand to your feet as we bow our heads, close our eyes, the piano will begin to play a song of invitation. Let's do business with the Lord. Are you thankful for the hedge this morning? Let's teach our children there's protection inside the hedge. Let's teach our grandchildren to love God, to put Him first. Let's be challenged by Job in his life to become more mature as a Christian to learn to hate evil more, to be upright in our ways.